God bless you. And we bless those who aren't here as well. Pray they're having a good summer and a good time of rest and refreshing. I think I understand leadership a lot better than I did 40 years ago when I began to lead and back 40 years ago when I thought I had it all figured out. My understanding of leadership now is, is pretty simple. It's getting from here to there. From here to there. In your home, if uh, one of your kids gets off track, it's getting into the presence of God and uh, getting a word from God that tells you how to help your your son, your daughter, get from here where they are now to there. And it's leading them from here to there. If your employer comes up to you and says, uh, we can't uh, keep you here any longer unless in the next three months you increase your sales by $10,000 every month. You have to take leadership of your situation and figure out how to get from, from here to, to there. I believe with all of my heart that the Church of Jesus Christ is meant to be a difference maker in its community. It's meant to be a leader in its community. But I think one of the things that grieves the Father heart of God is the church has lost its vision and sense of responsibility to help a community move from here to there. And we've become just a group of people who manage a, a set of weekly activities. The church of Jesus Christ is meant to be moving forward and taking new land over and over and over again. We're meant to be moving from, from here to there, from here to there. That's what leaders do. And the church has been established by God to be leaders in its community, in its city. Christians are meant to be leaders on their job. We're called as the people of God to, to leadership. Every great church has a vision. I'll back that statement up a little bit. Every great church has a vision. Every church has a vision, but every great church has a vision. The church that just has a vision has something they write in their bulletin. They publish it once a month or so. If you ask the people in the church what the vision is, they may not know it, but every great church has a vision that drives them. Every great church has a, has a vision that inspires them to action. Every church, every great church has this sense of the call of God upon them that is calling them to do something so big that it will never happen unless God comes alongside and helps them. Church is meant to be leading and it's meant to have vision. And so this morning I... I'm setting aside this time we have together to talk about us and talk about where we are and, and, and the fact that we need to move from here to, here to there. We can't be content with where we are. Where we are, where we're going, and, and how we're getting there. And I, I think the principle is not only apply to, to us collectively, though they, they also apply to whatever situation and whatever circumstance you find yourself in today in your own personal life. Jeremiah 17, and 
in verse 7. First word, but, but. Been in ministry now for 38 years. Been a great experience. Love God's church, love pastoring, love serving God's people. Yet in that, every once in a while, I get notes. And they usually start pretty nice. Pastor John, thank you for preaching to us every week. Thank you for uh, praying for us. Grateful that your wife invests in the women of our church. And then there's this word that shows up. But. But. And I know the real reason I've got this note is not anything before the but. It's Everything after the but that matters. Because the but is the real message. But. But. So let's get some context to the but. Verses 5 and 6. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who uh, draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush... In the wastelands, they will, not pro they will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. Cursed. We don't want to live there. But how do you live in this place where there's cursing, where you're like a bush in the wasteland where nothing seems to work out? How do you end up in this place, this parched place in the desert? And we have all had short seasons there, but you don't want to live there. How do you end up there? You end up there when you're putting your trust in man. When you're putting your trust in man and you're drawing your strength from flesh, your own flesh and the flesh of others around you. We don't want to live there. We don't want to live there as individuals. And we certainly don't want to live there as a church. So here comes the big but. And it's what's after the but that matters. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. <laughs> They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. We want to, as a church, live after the but. We want to be known in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. We want to be known in the areas outside of Saskatoon. We want to be known in this province, and we want to be known in this country as a church who has placed its confidence in God. And because our confidence is in God, we cannot and will not be shaken. God help you if your confidence is in me. Pretty shaky place to have confidence. Our confidence is in him. Our confidence is in him. We trust in the Lord. <laughs> and when we do that, what happens? We become a, like a tree planted by the, by the water. <laughs> and there's roots that come out. And my dream, friends, for Lawson Family of Ministries is for us to be a church that is firmly planted by the water and there's life that comes out of us. 
life that comes out of us into the city. And they look at Lawson and they say, that's a place where Jesus is being made real. And that's a place where the presence of God is felt and experienced. And that's a place where bondages are broken and people are set free. Friends, we want to live on the right-hand side of that butt. We want to live on the right side of the butt. Determined as a church to live on the right side of the butt. I uh, came into the office Thursday morning uh, in a bit of a transition at the district office. We're moving to Horizon College and Seminary, and uh, I'm out of Fairlight Drive until uh, that office work is finished. Thank you, Cam Duick and Kent Drisner, for helping me move Wednesday morning. So I came in here Thursday morning and was here a little bit and beautiful day. I decided to go down to the river and walk and pray and, and listen for God's voice in terms of what to share this morning. And I walked and I prayed and I, I, after about 45 minutes of walking and praying, I said, so, so Lord, where, where, where am I supposed to go this weekend? And and he's gracious, and he said, read the book of Joshua. So I took my, my phone, and I sat down on, on a park bench down there and undid a few buttons and let the sun shine on me and began to read. And as I read the book of Joshua... I realized here's a story that takes us, sees us going from here to, to there. Interesting how the book starts. <laughs> uh, Moses is dead. Now well, that kind of catches your attention, but that's exactly what it says right at the beginning. Moses is dead. Moses is dead, and uh, so uh, Joshua, get up and lead now across the land. So that's the story, Joshua crosses the land. His job is to get people from here to there to the other side of the Jordan. I looked at that and I realized as a church there's some principles there for us as we go from, from here to there and Lord willing and time permitting I want to share four of them with you this morning. And the first principle I see in this portion from moving from, from here to there is we're going to be strong and very courageous. We're going to be strong and very courageous. Joshua chapter 1 and uh, verse number 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. If you're going to take new land, if you're going to move from here to there, you have to be strong and very courageous. And I stand, sit before you this morning, and I want you to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that as a church, we are going to determine in our hearts, we are going to be strong and we're going to be very courageous. We are not going to be a bunch of spiritual wimps. We are going to be strong and very courageous. Our confidence, our hope, our trust is going to be in the Lord. I, uh, increasingly, increasingly, I'm seeing my, my dad as a great big hero. I think sometimes you have to get to a certain age before you see things that way, but dad's 85. I phoned him this week. We talked about a number of things, and, uh, and I said, Dad, how are you feeling? I kind of knew the answer to the question already because my sisters had been Facebooking me. How are you feeling, Dad? I said, John, I, I went to the doctor, and, and this part of the story I knew. He said, I have congestive heart failure. Um... But the doctor has told them there's nothing he can do, they can do about it now. And dad just has to learn how to slow down. 
I don't know if Dad knows much about slowing down, but I know Dad's a smart guy, and he'll figure it out. He said, so, John, I'm going to try to figure out how to <laughs> slow down. Dad has spent his life living with strength and courage. When I was five years of age, he left the church he was pastoring and moved to Calgary, Alberta. Didn't move to a church. What he moved to was a handshake from a district superintendent who said, if you come here, you can go to southeast Calgary and start a church. And when you started a church 30 or 40 years ago, it looked a lot different than when you started churches now. This was actually 50 years ago, 50-plus years ago. All you got was a handshake. You didn't get any money. You didn't get any people. You didn't get any help building a church. You just got a handshake. And my dad went into southeast Calgary with nothing more than a sense that that's what he was supposed to be doing and a handshake from a district superintendent. And I saw my dad labor and toil in southeast Calgary for 12 years I was growing up to see a church planted in an area that did not have a church. And I look back at that now and I say, that wasn't normal. That is is an act of strength, and that's an act of courage. And friends, I want to declare to all of our spirits today that Lawson Family of Ministries is not going to be a bunch of wimps. We are going to be strong, and we're going to be very courageous, and we're going to take land nobody else will dare to take because we believe that God wants the church to be leaders in the community. We are going to be strong. We're going to be strong, and we're going to be very courageous. And I walk into Avonhurst about three months ago to preach on a Sunday morning. I did what there what I do everywhere where I'm preaching. I get alone. I find some corner in the building, and I begin to pray, and I begin to cry out to God. I begin to speak in tongues and build up my spirit. I'm crying out to God, and I'm praying, and I'm saying, uh, Lord, help me as I minister today. And, and I finished my time of prayer, and I'm walking out of that little corner I'd found to hide in, and I'm walking down the hallway towards the sanctuary, and a lady, she's older than me, so I had to listen to her. She said, stop. So I stopped. She says, you stay there. So I stayed there. She said, somebody needs to talk to you. So I stand there, and I'm not sure what's happening, but she, in about a minute and a half, brings a lady to me. The lady's name was Agnes, but I've never known her as Agnes. She doesn't like the name Agnes. She is known as Cookie. Everybody thinks her name is Cookie. Well, here comes Cookie. Cookie was... Uh, the second or third convert that came to Christ when Dad went into uh, southeast Calgary to start a church. <laughs> and she spent the last 45 years of her life living on next to nothing and cooking food around the world for teenagers and young adults who are going on missions trips. She just, all she does is she hops around from place to place and makes sure that they're eating well on missions trip. Doesn't have much. <laughs> but she spent her life investing in the gospel going forward. And if my strong and courageous dad went into Calgary and all, it's all that happened, I say glory be to God and blessings on you. You're my hero, dad. We're going to be people who invest in other people so the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God advances. We are going to be strong and we're going to be very courageous. I want to talk about who we are around here because I'm not sure as we have grown that we really completely get it. When I, uh, when I came and was interviewed for, by the pastoral search committee over 12 years ago, um, they asked me a question, when you get here, what are you going to do? When you get here, what are you going to do? I'm sure they thought that was a fair question. I'm not sure they liked my answer, but they didn't like it enough to scratch me off their list. My answer to the question, what are you going to do, was, I don't know. Because I don't, and I didn't, and I don't know. All I knew is that God would speak to us, and God would allow us to be used, and we'd try to be obedient, and... Certainly, if I had been gazing into some prophetic crystal ball that evening when they asked me that question, 
I never would have dreamt that 12 years after starting, we would be worshiping in four different settings on a weekend. Never even crossed my mind. But this church, every weekend now, gathers in four different settings. Sunday morning, Lawson, you're here. Saturday church, uh, good service last night, and we rejoice in the exciting things that God has done there over the last six years since it started. And Life Community Church in Martinsville, there's exciting, exciting things happening in Martinsville. I, I just think that little group has a great and glorious future under God. And just so we keep our eyes looking forward, I made one up, Neighborhood Church Dundurn. But, but we're, we're here, friends, not to just, just be satisfied with where we're at. We are called to be people who are strong and courageous, and we're moving from here to there. We're taking new land for God and for the glory of God, to see God's kingdom extended. It is not about us. And friends, if your concept of church is you got Jesus really happy with you, if you come to church once a week and sing two fast songs and three slow ones, and you put some money in the offering, and God's real happy with you because you get a tax receipt at the end of the year, you better wake up. forgive me, but you better wake up. We are supposed to be salt and light in our communities. We're supposed to be difference makers. We are supposed to be people who are seeing the kingdom of God advance for the glory of God. So what we need to be clear on is that Lawson uh, is not a church with multi-settings. We are not a church with multi-settings. This may not seem significant to you, but this is what we are. We are a church of multi-settings. And that's a phenomenal difference. Because as long as you think we are a church with multi-settings, the concept we have is Sunday morning loss. That's the big church. That's the good church. That's the important one. And unfortunately, we got these four brats out there that we have to look after. We are a church of multi-settings, and everyone matters, and everyone is equally important. Everyone matters, and everyone is equal. I'd be in, in deep doo-doo if I'd raised my family with the concept that, well, Evan's the firstborn, so that's the one I'm going to pay attention to. The other two just, oh, I hope you make it. But we're not going to invest, because Evan's the, fir uh, the first one. The one. Every single one of these groups, every single one of these sites, every one of these, singles, uh, these settings is important, and they matter equally, and they're equally important and equally significant in terms of what God has called us to do and be. We need to understand that. We need to, <laughs> we need to wrap our hearts around that. This is not what God's doing. That is what God is doing. Come on up here, Samuel, just for a minute. This is, this is exciting, too. This is what God is doing. Sunday, Sunday, uh, after, come on in here. Let's walk in the light over here. Sunday, Sunday afternoon, this good pastor brother gathers with, uh, you got three, four, five coming every Sunday afternoon. And uh, they come together and they pray for their people who live in this city. And they're believing God to see the kingdom of God extended and God's kingdom reaching out to them. And I commend you for that. And that's important to us. That matters to us. We want to see God use you. We want to see the kingdom of God extended through you. We want to see the beautiful people of India reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message they may not have got at home, but they come to Canada and they come to Saskatoon and they're prayed over and we believe for God to do a work in their hearts. Blessings on you, brother. Blessings on you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Pastor Samuel's wife and daughter are back in India and they haven't uh, got all the visa stuff worked out yet, but they need to be here with him. Father, I pray in Jesus' name right now that you will work out every one of those details and get Samuel and his wife and Samuel and his beautiful young daughter united with him. Holy Spirit, be at work and bring them, oh God, bring them together to Saskatoon so your kingdom will advance. 
In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. We are not a church with multi-settings. We are a church of multi-settings. And every one of those settings, every one of those sites matters deeply as we see the kingdom of God go forward. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Six quick reasons why enough is not enough. Number one, we have a responsibility as people for the spiritual destiny of individuals in North Saskatoon and beyond. This, my friends, is not about us finding some people that we can eat hamburgers together with and have pizza over with on for have pizza with on Friday night. Our responsibility is to be kingdom people who are seeing and understand our responsibility for the spiritual destiny of a nation, the spiritual destiny of a province, and the spiritual destiny of a city. Number two. Multi-setting churches reach more people than single-setting churches. I don't understand it, but churches that are establishing new settings, new sites to read on on the weekend, are the churches in North America that are growing and are reaching more people for Christ. Number three, multi-setting churches have a track record for developing healthy churches. Why do they have a track record for developing healthy churches? It's simple, because it's healthy churches that are concerned about seeing other churches started. And there's a DNA there of health. And you just keep replicating healthy DNA. Healthy churches are being started uh, by other healthy churches. Volunteerism increases in multi-setting environments. We'll say I'm against it if it means I have to work. The church is not about singing two fast songs, three slow ones, and putting money in the offering. It's about getting involved to see God's work go ahead and God's kingdom extended. And to do it well, we all have to rise up, step up to the plate, and say, count on me, Lord, I'm in. I'm going to do what I can. I can see you like that. Number five. More people get baptized, the more we reach out. Multi-setting churches baptize more people than single-setting churches. Number six, 90% of multi-setting startups succeed. Now, I told you my dad went into Calgary uh, when I was five years of age and started the church basically with just the handshake of a district superintendent. 50% of churches that are started that way succeed. My dad fought through some hard stuff. Only less than 50% actually succeed done that way. But when a, when a church says we are as a church starting another place to meet and work, 90% of those last and survive and thrive. We need to be seeing the gospel go forward. We need to be committed to it. Enough is not enough. So as a family, we're going to be strong and we're going to be very courageous. We're number two, uh, going to be people who know and live the word of God. Our mission statement here at Lawson goes like this. We're here to influence people for Jesus Christ by, number one, teaching and applying scriptures to our lives. I, I'm just going to stop there. We'll bring the other up in a minute. But, friends, that's the first statement in our mission statement. We believe in the importance of God's Word. We believe in the power of God's Word. And we believe it needs to be lived, and we know, believe it needs to be taught. Joshua chapter 1. In verse number 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that it... What do you do with God's Word? Well, I come and hear the sermon on Sunday morning. No, that's not what you do. You meditate on it, so that you may be careful to what? What's that word up there at the end of the third line? Do. And we're going to be people who uh, hear God's Word and we apply it to our lives. We live it out. We live it out. So, mission statement. Influencing people for Jesus Christ by teaching and applying the Scriptures to our lives, loving and caring for one another, and adding value to North Saskatoon and beyond. When you say, Lawson's my home, you have signed up to be a part of a group that is not sitting around playing tiddlywinks. We are here to add value to North Saskatoon and beyond. We are here to be difference makers. Oh, Father, help us. Number three. We're going to be valiant warriors committed to seeing the kingdom of God extended. Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 14. 
your wives, your little ones, your cattle. Uh, they shall uh, remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond Jordan, but you shall cross before your brothers in battle array all your valiant warriors and shall help them. I've known Ted Duke for uh, 25 years or so, maybe a wee bit more. And uh, he came and spoke at uh, Living Waters Camp this summer in the e in, as the evening speaker the first half of the week. Only speaks once a day now at his age. And the reason he only speaks once a day is if I spoke like him, I'd speak about once a month. I mean, he puts his whole soul and body and energy and voice into the thing. On a Wednesday morning, Ted Duke said, one of the uh, things the church has to wake up to is we have been missing half of our responsibility. He said, the church of Jesus Christ in North America has fallen in love with the gospel. And we should. Aren't you glad for the gospel? Aren't you glad that God reached down to us sinners condemned unclean and washed us white as snow and gave us hope and a future, not only for down here, but hope and a future for eternity? I think that's worth being excited about. I think that's worth investing in. I love the gospel. He says, but the problem is we have been content to park in the gospel. We've been content to get together and sing there's power in the blood and get excited about it and think, man, this is great the way we're singing it this morning. Everybody up there has got it just right. And there's power in the blood. Thank God for the gospel. And we have missed the Lord's emphasis as he was down here on earth. And his emphasis down here on earth was that the kingdom of God would come. And the responsibility of the church is to be vessels in the hand of God, seeing the kingdom of God advance. It's not just about us knowing we're forgiven. It's going with the glorious message of the kingdom where people are set free and lives are changed and people who were imprisoned are no longer in prison. God comes and breaks bondages and God comes and heals marriages. God comes and sets people free from addictions. The church of Jesus Christ is salt and light. The church of Jesus Christ is this group of people who are concerned not just about the good news of the gospel. The church of Jesus Christ is this group who is deeply committed to seeing the kingdom advance. And he said that we've kind of lost sight of that half. Well, God's going to give us clearer vision here increasingly in this house. And we're going to be valiant warriors. Valiant warriors, deeply committed to seeing the kingdom of God go forward. Uh, last point. We're going to be a church that loves and craves God's presence. We're going to be a church that loves and craves God's presence. So I'm down at the river and I'm reading through Joshua and Joshua 1. Oh, that's neat. And Joshua 2, well, Lord, I don't see much there. And I get to Joshua 3, and I think it's verse 6, and I read this. And Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people, so they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead of the people. <laughs> How did they get to the other side of the land? How did they get from here to, to there? What did they need to get from here to, to there? They needed the, the Ark of the, the Covenant, verses 11 and 12, same chapter. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. 
Now then, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above all will stand in one heap. What's he say? You're going to cross to the other side of the Jordan, and when you put your feet in that water, what happens to the water? Piles up on both sides, and they walk through on dry land. But catch it, my friends. It was not putting their feet in the water that did it. What put it, what made it happen, is they were carrying the ark on their shoulders. And the ark in the Old Testament represents the presence of God. And you're making a mistake, friends, to think we can make a difference in this city and in this province without the presence of God. All we're going to end up with if we try to cross in a new land without the presence of God is a lot of people with soaking wet blue jeans. It's the presence of God that prepares the land. It's the presence of God that disperses the things that prevent you from moving forward. We long for it, loss, and we crave for the presence of God. Exodus 25. Verses 13 and 15. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. So I want you to get this picture. There's this ark. And on the ark, there are these rings on the side, and there's these poles running through the rings. But how does the ark get moved around? Somebody grabs a hold of the poles, 12 people actually. And I tell you, friends, the only thing that makes the church of God the world-changing force that the Lord intends and dreams and desires for it to be is when some men and women get serious about entering into the presence of God and carrying the presence of God on their shoulders. And if we're not serious about the presence of God and pursuing the presence of God and carrying the presence of God, we're just playing around. It's the presence of God that sees the kingdom of God advanced. That's why uh, Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. in this sanctuary, Wednesday day of prayer and fasting, and Wednesday we come together and pray, is probably the most important thing we do in Lawson Family of Ministries. We've got to be praying. We've got to be seeking God in God's presence. We read this story, sad, sad, sad story in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and uh, verse 3. David decided he needed to get the presence of God back in Jerusalem, but it was too much work to find 12 people who would pay the price to carry it on their shoulders. So what did they do? What did they do? They got a new cart, and they placed the ark on a cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And as in Ohio, not Ohio, but Ohio, the sons of Abinadab were leading the new cart. They thought they could get the presence of God into Jerusalem by putting it on a cart. But there's no new carts. Hear me, friends. Hear me clearly. There's no new cart that will see the kingdom of God extended. The only thing that will see the kingdom of God extended is when some leaders say God's work and God's kingdom and the eternal destiny of men and women matter so much to me that I'm going to personally commit myself to carrying the presence of God on my shoulder. I'm getting a little something. But whatever that something is, it's not probably healthy for me. But I'm getting a little concerned that I see such a desire to discover new ways and new things to do because we think if we can find some new ways and new things, then the gospel will go forward. New ways and new things don't work. What works is when men and women get so stirred in their hearts about the spiritual condition of their family and the spiritual condition of their city, spiritual condition of their church, that they say, I'm going to deal with this. I personally am going to seek the presence of God and carry it on my shoulders. Lord. 
Well, that's good preaching. They try to carry it on a new cart. And this is what happens. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out towards the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. <laughs> God was upset with these people, because they thought cows could deliver the presence of God. Cows cannot deliver the presence of God. It's men and women who get serious about making sure the presence of God is around. That's the only way to carry the presence of God. It has to be carried on the shoulders of men and women. So they're trying to get the presence of God to Jerusalem on a new cart. And the cows got a little upset about something in the threshing floor, and they start to shake, and the ark begins to shake. And, and Uzzah doesn't understand how important it is to be carrying the presence of God right, and he just reaches out and tries to settle it, and God strikes him dead. And King David is so upset that God struck Uzzah dead. When the cart began to shake, he said, I'm not touching this anymore. I, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And we read, as we go down the chapter, verse 13, or verse 11, that the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, because David couldn't figure out how to get it to Jerusalem. Thought the cart would work. Well, the cart doesn't work. You have to carry it on the presence of God. But notice what happened when the ark, when the ark of the covenant is in the house at Obed-Edom. The Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. If we want the blessing of God, friends, there has to be a hunger and thirst in our hearts, and there has to be a hunger and thirst in this church for the presence of God. That's how it works. Uh, Joshua 3, verse 3. And uh, I just want you to notice how the story started. For when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you'll set out from your place and go after it. <laughs> I believe it's time for Lawson's family of ministries to set out from this place and go after this province and see the kingdom of God advanced. But here's how we know when it's going to happen. God will have raised up some people with an unshakable commitment to carry the presence of God into this place and into this ministry. That's when it'll happen. Are you willing to be one of them? Are you willing to be one of them? <laughs> 